but the ones that remain were repurposed to connect to the lungs, to the to the lungs, to the lungs, to the lungs. You've got the nutrients, the gases, but if there's no way to distribute them to the rest of the organ systems, then GG. This is exactly what the circulatory system is for. And contrary to what most people know, the circulatory system is actually composed of two separate systems, the cardiovascular system and the lymphatic system. And while we will sort of touch on both, we will focus more on the cardiovascular system. I'm gonna keep saying this if I have to. Crash Course is always here to give us a lowdown on the basic form and function of your mammalian cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system is composed of these structures right here, and it is actually the first system to start functioning during embryonic development. They start out as little blood islands, and then they'll eventually form the blood and the blood vessels. The blood itself carries the molecules needed for the organism's metabolism. The RBCs carry the gases, and it is only in adult mammals that they are enucleated. This is possibly as an adaptation to be able to squeeze through the very tight capillaries and also to maximize its oxygen carrying capacity. But the blood can't make its way around the body without the blood vessels. And the two general types of blood vessels, arteries and veins, follow a basic pattern recurrent across the different groups of vertebrates. Dr. Walter John's playlist, Walter John, Walter Jan? I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Anyway, his playlist on the fate of the aortic arches can hopefully help you visualize the modification from this basic pattern. But if I must super simplify this, then what we are seeing is that we start out with a series of aortic arches that correspond with the number of gills. But because tetrapods no longer have gills, they lost most of the aortic arches associated with those gills. But the ones that remain were repurposed to connect to the lungs, the head, and also to become the systemic arch that also distributes blood to the rest of the organs of the body. With veins, we see something similar. There's a basic pattern with all of the major vessels, and then some are lost or repurposed or redirected or some of them combine. I think what's more fascinating about the venous system that we ought to discuss is the portal venous system, in which the blood from one organ can go to another organ without passing through the heart. It should therefore be no surprise that the organs that have portal veins are those that first need to sift through the blood before having it redistributed everywhere else. All vertebrates have the hepatic portal system. If there are toxins from the foods we've eaten, the stomach and intestines can pass this into the liver via the hepatic portal vein. Because God forbid, na ibalik nila yun sa puso agad, edi kumalat na yun lason. The renal portal system is absent in mammals, and it's not exactly clear why. But this is most likely related to the type and abundance of water in a particular environment and also the efficiency of the organism's kidneys. The hypophysial portal system allows the tropic hormones from the hypothalamus to proceed to the hypophysis, the target organ of those hormones anyway. So parang bakit mo pa siya ikakalat? Eh, kailangan mo lang naman siyang ibaba dun sa kapitbahay mo. The way arteries and veins are arranged in the body is no accident either. Their positions relative to each other are important in thermoregulation and also overall protection. There's high pressure in the arteries, so you want to keep that a little deeper in the body. Because if you get injured and you nick an artery, that's going to be like... <laughs> The blood in the blood vessels can only really get around with the help of a pump. Primitively, you just have the peristaltic motion of the blood vessels themselves, and that would have been fine. But as the organism increases in size and complexity, obviously that's not going to be enough. So you need a heart. The heart itself starts out like most things inside the vertebrate body. A tube. Of the different vertebrate groups, it's fish hearts that most closely resemble the basic four-chambered heart, with blood entering from the organs to the sinus venosus, then to the atrium, then to the ventricle, and then to the bulbus cordis, which is differentiated into the conus arteriosus or the concus arteriosus depending on their fates, then to the gills, then to the organs again, in what we call a single circulation pattern. The flow of blood is one way, but the arrangement of this tube sort of folds into like an S or a Z shape. But the point is the atrium is more dorsal to the ventricle, so that gravity can actually assist in moving the blood from the atrium to the ventricle. You'll notice that the atrium in the most basic tubular heart is more posterior to the ventricle. In embryonic development, it all starts out like this. So how the fuck did adult hearts end up with the atria more anterior to the ventricle? You should know by now that tubes in 
in confined spaces will inevitably flex and twist. In the case of the heart, this is what led to the shifting of the relative positions of the chambers. Nevertheless, the blood flow still follows the same route. Along with the flexing and twisting of the heart, you will see that atria and ventricles also become subdivided into left and right halves. Separating the atria and ventricles resulted in a double circulation pattern, with blood needing to pass through the pulmonary and systemic routes to complete one circuit. And this is what we observe in terrestrial vertebrates. The challenge with having lungs and this double circulation pattern is when the organism is underwater. Hence, hearts of semi-aquatic or aquatic tetrapods are adapted for those changing oxygen levels by shunting blood from one circuit to another. Let's explore these intermediate hearts. Starting with amphibians, most of them have a sinus venosus, two atria, one ventricle, and a conus arteriosus. While it is tempting to think that oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix in the ventricle, which I used to also think, surprisingly, certain structures such as the trabeculae in the internal walls of the ventricle and the spiral valve in the conus arteriosus are able to separate deoxygenated and oxygenated streams of blood relatively efficiently. But what happens when a frog dives into the water? It can actually redirect the flow of blood from the lungs to the skin by constricting and dilating their respective blood vessels. Reptilian hearts are just as diverse as the members of this clade. Turtles and squamates have an interventricular septum, but the three chambers of the ventricle are actually still interconnected. It's not like completely separating the ventricle into left and right halves. There's still like some holes and canals in there. Turtles are able to redirect the flow of blood to bypass the lungs and head straight to the systemic circuit when they are underwater. Crocodile hearts have ventricles that are completely divided into left and right halves. Instead of shunting the blood via the interconnected ventricles, they instead use the foramen of panizza. I don't know how to say panizza, panizza, pizza. <laughs> which interconnects the right and left systemic arches. While it is difficult to trace where the blood is coming from and where it's headed, what is important to remember is that the shunting of blood ultimately limits blood flow to the lungs when the animal is holding its breath. Instead of having blood pass the lungs and not get any oxygen anyway, that same energy could be spent sending that blood back to the systemic circuit to pick up more waste products that are still accumulating in the animal's tissues. Bird hearts are very similar to mammalian hearts, but the same four-chambered configuration arose independently in both groups, most likely because of the demands of an endothermic and homeothermic lifestyle. Their hearts have a complete separation of the pulmonary and systemic circuits, so there is no way to redirect blood flow even if the animal holds its breath. Birds and mammals that do dive underwater are now stuck with a suboptimal version of a heart, which is really effective on land, but not when you're in water. Their workaround for this is by slowing their heart rates, decreasing the blood supply to less important organs, and switching to anaerobic metabolism. But let's not forget another component of the circulatory system, the lymphatic system. Its function is fairly similar across all vertebrate groups, so off the crash course we go. And if your heart longs for more, then here are a few more videos that can hopefully deepen your understanding and appreciation of the circulatory system. I'll see you in the next one!